Landrover reckons that this Discovery Sport is the most versatile premium compact SUV currently on sale, and it's a credible claim. This is, after all, the only prestigiously badged car in this segment that can seat seven. It's also smart, practical, safe, and rugged enough to go a lot further than its rivals off the beaten track. In short, there's nothing else quite like it. Think of Land Rover's current product lineup, and you have to think in terms of three things. Luxury, as defined by the various Range Rover models, the dual purpose practical role typified by the tough Defender range, and the leisure emphasis of the Discovery lineup. One that starts right here with this car, the Discovery Sport. Yes, this is Land Rover's representative in the important compact SUV segment, but it's far more than simply a direct replacement for the Freelander models that previously filled that role. These were cars that sat uncertainly between mainstream RAV4 and CRV style soft rotors in this class and the more premium badged models typified by contenders like BMW's X3 and Audi's Q5. As a far more upmarket looking thing than its predecessor, this Discovery Sport now firmly positions itself in with the pricier players. It's certainly stylish enough to do so, though stylishly practical rather than stylishly fashionable. The difference is important, for this car has been carefully designed to appeal to a different, more family oriented set of buyers than are targeted by the Solihull company's similarly sized and priced, but much trendier Range Rover Evoque. Further setting these two models apart is the Discovery Sport's other key attribute and the major selling point it offers over its smaller predecessor, namely its ability to seat seven. So you've got the idea. This car is different from a Freelander, different from an Evoque, and according to Land Rover at least, different from the competition too. That seven seat configuration is after all a first in the premium part of the compact SUV sector. Nor has this segment ever had a contender that can actually seriously pull its weight off-road. Adding quality, technology and the usual unrivaled brand equity, and it all sounds quite promising. Time to put this car to the test. Set off, and this car feels exactly as any Land Rover of this kind should. The high set driving position and excellent all round visibility do a fine job in compensating for the fact that as compact SUVs go, this Discovery Sport isn't actually very compact. The facts are that it's actually both longer and wider than the original first generation Range Rover, something you particularly realise in urban parking situations. Despite that though, on the move it's a vehicle that's easy to place with confidence through the turns. In fact, Land Rover's success in finessing both ride and handling is probably one of the most impressive aspects of this car. It's never going to be quite as sharp to drive as rivals from BMW, Audi, Volvo and Lexus, but then these models have few aspirations towards off-road prowess. As we'll see in a minute, the Discovery Sport does, and given that, the extent of its road-going repertoire is wider than it really has any right to be. It's not as lithe and agile as a Q5 or an X3, of course it's not, but I'd say that this Land Rover easily matches the kind of driving dynamics you'd find in other rivals like Volvo's XC60 or the Lexus NX. Much of the reason why centres around the steering. Gone is the vague wishy-washy helm you used to get in a Freelander, and in its place there's an alert and natural feeling set up providing for the kind of precise and accurate corner turn-in that allows you to make good use of the torque vectoring by braking system. This is one of those that quells understeer through a sharp corner, lightly braking the outside front wheels in a way that subtly tightens your line and fires you from bend to bend. That's also helped by the fact that there's very little body roll and a surprising amount of grip for an SUV weighing nearly two tonnes. It all means that you can get into a real driving flow with this car, aided by a suspension setup that gets better the faster you go. It's a specially developed rear multi-link system that's especially good at dealing with undulating surfaces through quick flowing curves, 
though is less impressive over the terrible tarmac that characterises our inner cities. That's why on the school run you may well feel that this discovery sport is living up to his name with a greater level of firmness than other rivals deliver. Still, if you can live with that, then there's little else not to like. On to engines, which are Land Rover's advanced 2-litre four-cylinder Ingenium TD4 units, shared with the Range Rover Evoque and designed to deliver improved efficiency along with class-leading torque and power. The most affordable TD4 unit in the range comes with 150 PS and 350 newton metres of torque, but it's only offered with this car in five-seat form. Here, 62 miles an hour from rest occupies 11 seconds on the way to 112 miles an hour. Most, though, will want the 180 PS variant, which comes only with the seven-seat layout and delivers a much lustier 430 newton metres of torque. Here, there's a maximum speed of 117 miles an hour, while 62 miles an hour from rest takes 9.4 seconds, though you can reduce this figure by a second if you take up the option of the slick 9-speed ZF Auto gearbox many owners will want. More importantly, this variant has enough pulling power to permit a towing capability of up to 2,500 kilograms when the optional tow pack is fitted. Both the TD4 power plants come mated exclusively to four-wheel drive. This, by the way, is a proper permanent setup rather than the less effective on-demand all-wheel drive system that this car's less capable competitors use and which Land Rover itself offers on this model in other markets. This car's permanent, intelligent four-wheel drive arrangement continuously varies the torque split front to rear, depending on conditions, and is, as before, mated to Land Rover's excellent terrain response system, which, via a control panel here at the bottom of the centre console, allows you to select a drive programme to match the sort of off-road conditions the car's experiencing. This feature acts almost like an off-road expert sat alongside you, selecting the best traction mode for any given terrain type from four main settings. General driving, grass, gravel, snow, mud and ruts, and sand. Once you've chosen a mode, you've only to leave the car's electronics to work out how best to dole out power and maximise traction, sniffing out grip where none seems to exist and turning the Discovery Sport into an impressively capable off-road tool. My only slight disappointment with this setup here is that it doesn't provide you with the set-and-forget auto mode that's offered on larger Land Rover models and which effectively makes all the decisions for you. Those bigger solihull designs also get another thing that the company's smaller models have always lacked, a proper low-range transfer gearbox. Dedicated mud pluggers would certainly appreciate that on this car, but for everyone else, the extra transmission ratios would simply represent useless extra weight. Anyway, even as it is, the spec of this car should enable you to get a remarkable distance off the beaten track. Ground clearance is 211 millimetres, one reason why the car can wade through up to 600 millimetres of water. That's 100 millimetres more even than the military surplus Defender model. Plus the 25 degree approach angle, the 21 degree breakover angle and the 31 degree departure angle are all very good for a model of this size. Axle articulation in particular is easily best in class. At 340 millimetres, up to 60 millimetres more than you get with most rivals. If you are going to be testing that out, then you'll be glad of this sophisticated gradient release control system, a logical extension of the useful hill descent control system that comes into its own when descending steep and slippery slopes. Product differentiation is everything in the current market, and it's especially important to Land Rover. The Solihull brand has the difficult task of trying to make its leisure orientated Discovery model lineup stylish enough to compete with other premium brands, yet not so fashionable that its cars trample on territory set aside for the company's trendier, more luxury orientated Range Rover models. Given that remit, it's difficult to fault what's been achieved with this Discovery Sport. It's clearly a Land Rover, the clamshell bonnet and the distinctive two-bar grille are brand staples that blend with the functional, practical and reasonably rugged look. 
At the same time though, this car's clunky SUV genre is less obvious. The styling instead, suggestive of something nimble, compact, upmarket and smoothly aerodynamic. To have achieved all that and at the same time created a car large enough to take seven people is particularly impressive. Prior to this model's arrival, family 4x4s with space for three rows of seats look boxy and boring. The Discovery Sport is different, disguising its size really well. The smart front end helps here with sleek wraparound corners that reduce the visual bulk of the front overhang and are embellished by careful little touches of design. Take the detail that you'll find in these smartly styled headlamps. Here, circular daytime running lights are punctuated at four equal intervals to represent the points of the compass and underline a sense of adventure further emphasised by this front skid plate. In profile, the most distinctive feature is this substantial C-pillar that rakes dramatically forwards and stops just short of the gloss black window surrounds, allowing for an optional contrasting roof colour to suit those that want it. Now, designer Jerry McGovern and his team have also worked a lot of shape into the flanks with a horizontal blade-like feature line that flows from the distinctive front fender vents and sweeps backwards along the bodywork. Add in a dynamic sill and strong wheel arches and you have a car with a genuinely athletic stance. Move around to the back and there's another silver skid plate, this one framed by twin exhaust outlets and sitting below beautifully detailed rear light units with a circular motif in the brake light signature that's split by the tailgate opening. But style of this kind I expected. My greater concerns in approaching this car always lay, as yours might, in the luggage space accessible beyond this rear hatch. Any vehicle that bills itself as being in any way compact, yet which claims to offer space for seven people, would, you'd think, surely be compromised here. In the event, the issues aren't insurmountable, mainly because of the key engineering feature that under the skin sets the Discovery Sport apart from its Range Rover Evoque showroom stablemate. Though the two cars share the same front end structure, this car is unique from the B-pillar backwards, is 80 millimetres longer and gets its own very compact multi-link rear axle which frees up space for the fold-out third row seating and ensures that the uh, rear suspension turrets make minimal intrusion into this luggage area. As a result, there's a class competitive capacity of around 500 litres, measured up to tonneau cover level. Or as much as 829 litres if you load up to the roof. Push forward the sliding rear bench and you can increase this total to as much as 981 litres while still carrying five passengers. And you can tilt this backrest more vertically if you've something really awkward to carry that won't quite fit in. There's also a middle section that can fold down for really long items and you can make the most of the space on offer with various optional nets that compartmentalise your luggage. Of course, space-wise, it's a different story if you're using the third row seats. Uh, they are occasional use chairs that fold out in one swift movement. Now with these in place, you'll have just 194 litres of space to play with and a, a few compartments under the floor. That's enough for a few shopping bags, but not a lot else. Still, most owners will use these seats even more rarely than they fold down the split folding second row backrest, which you can do with these useful buttons. Now with this flat, it frees up a class leading 1,698 litre total capacity. Unfortunately, there's no option to specify a fold flat front passenger seat and go even further. Still, the total capacity you do get is nearly 20% greater than an Evoque can offer and 10 to 15% more than you'd get in rivals like BMW's X3 and Audi's Q5. Time to take a seat up front in the so-called Sports Command driving position, a pleasant perch from which you realise just how far the designers of this car have come since they created the Freelander the big buttons and utilitarian plastic surfaces of that car are here replaced by soft touch rotary controls and tactile buttons set in gloss black surrounds. Many of these are borrowed from the Evoque. As with that car, the circular gear selector for automatic models glides up from the centre console on startup. 
Here, though, the overall theme is logic rather than luxury, an approach that might at first seem a little less premium than that championed by this car's German rivals. But then that's appropriate. This car is, after all, more family orientated. In any case, it is smart in its own mature, understated way, with the cabin appealingly dominated by the striking intersection between the bold vertical lines of the centre console and the slimmer horizontal elements of the instrument panel. You view this through a smart three-spoke leather-trimmed multifunction steering wheel, the binnacle housing deeply set twin analogue dials separated by a five-inch colour TFT display, delivering key data on things like fuel levels, gear position, temperature and the chosen terrain response mode. Build quality from the Merseyside factory seems strong and everything feels appropriately solid to the point where you really feel you could use this car maybe even hose it out with a farmyard jet wash if you had to not something you could imagine an Evoque or a BMW X3 owner ever doing. Practicality is covered off by large 13.8 litre door bins while the adoption of an electric handbrake frees up space on the transmission tunnel for extra storage that includes this uh, compartment with a sliding top uh, concealing two removable cup holders. Uh, there's also a neat trinket tray set into the dashboard ahead of the front seat passenger and you get a decently sized glove box too. It's also worth noting that around the car you can specify up to uh, four 12 volt power points and as many as six USB sockets so everyone can plug in or log on. You can find a number of these in this useful centre console box. The key cabin feature though lies here in the centre of the dash. At last Land Rover has delivered a state of the art infotainment screen to its volume buyers. The 8 inch display is clear easy to navigate around and very informative. Unfortunately though, you can't access it via the kind of rotary controller that makes comparable Audi and BMW infotainment systems so easy to get to grips with. Instead, you have to jab away uh, using touchscreen functionality if, like me, you can't get to grips with voice control. Still, once you do master the setup, it's undeniably very impressive, not only dealing with the expected uh, audio, uh, climate, telephone and navigation functions, but also allowing access to Land Rover's suite of in-control connected car technologies. Most will want the in-control apps feature that allows you to select from a whole series of downloadable compatible apps. Time to move rearwards and experience this car from a passenger perspective, one enhanced by the way that this middle row's so-called stadium seating is slightly raised by 50 millimetres, giving occupants the kind of very good view out they always appreciated in the old Freelander. This car is a little narrower than that one was, but it won't feel noticeably more cramped, even if you insist on trying to squeeze three adults across the back seat. Now, as with other models in this class, that's not an ideal recipe for longer journeys. Though such trips can be made more bearable by the way that the backrest tilts for greater comfort. When it comes to legroom, though, there are fewer caveats. Back here, you really appreciate the extra 80 millimetres of wheelbase this car enjoys over its Range Rover Evoque Stablemate something further aided by these cutouts in the backs of the front seats that free up more space for your knees. If you need more, then the seat base can be slid backwards by up to 160 millimetres to create as much as 112 millimetres of knee room and 1,011 millimetres of leg room, which could make this rear seat almost as accommodating as that in a Range Rover. You won't want to be pushing this second row bench back though if you've passengers above preschool age sat behind you in the fold out third row. Land Rover calls this car a 5 plus 2 seater which probably clues you into the fact that these extra pews are for occasional child use only. On that basis there's not much point moaning that they're not especially easy to get to or that the head and leg room provided once you do uh, and once you are installed is somewhat cramped. 
The point is that these chairs are there if you need them, the kind of thing that can't be provided by any other direct competitor in this class. On that basis, they're very welcome. In the Freeland era, there was always quite a price gap between Land Rover's compact and full-sized SUVs. Part of this Discovery Sports remit is to narrow that, this car there to push the brand's compact SUV offering up market, which in turn makes room for the company's new generation Defender model to slot in beneath. That explains pricing that sits in the £33,000 to £43,000 bracket for mainstream models, which are powered by the brand's latest 2-litre TD4 Ingenium series diesel engines. There's a choice of two. A 150 PS unit you can only specify if you're happy to have this car in five-seat form with a manual gearbox. Or a 180 PS unit that only comes with the seven-seat layout and provides the choice of either manual transmission or a nine-speed automatic that's offered at an £1,800 model-for-model premium. Across the range, buyers are offered the choice between four trim levels, SE, SE Tech, HSE and HSE Luxury. Whatever your choice, all variants come with permanent four-wheel drive. That kind of pricing positions this model firmly into the premium part of the compact SUV segment, around £5,000 above more mainstream contenders like Honda's CRV and Toyota's RAV4, and directly into competition with more prestigiously badged options in this sector, like BMW's X3, Audi's Q5, Volvo's XC60 and the Lexus NX. Slightly awkwardly for Land Rover, it also means that Discovery Sport pricing now very similarly replicates the kind of money you'd pay for a Range Rover Evoque, giving buyers a straight showroom choice between the practicality you get here and the Evoque's more overtly fashionable approach. In fact, you could argue that to be the choice you're making in preferring this Discovery Sport to all of the premium rivals I've just mentioned. It does, after all, stand alone amongst them in offering useful seven-seat functionality. Until the launch of this model, if you wanted that, you had to get something boxy, utilitarian and Korean in the form of Hyundai Santa Fe and Kia Sorento. Both of these cars remain as slightly cheaper, slightly larger alternatives to this Land Rover, but it's difficult to see many potential Discovery Sport buyers looking in that direction. Fashion and brand equity speak loudly in this segment. No, they'll be focusing primarily on comparisons against the BMW, Audi, Volvo and Lexus models I just mentioned, all of which are priced pretty much identically to the kind of money that you'll have to pay here. It would be understandable if, having considered all of this, you're tempted towards Discovery Sport ownership. I've already pointed out this car's seven-seat advantage, and it's also considerably more adept than its rivals in the rough stuff. If that seals the deal for you, then you'll want to know just how generous Land Rover has been with the standard spec. And the answer is that most of what you'll need is included as part of the standard deal, though rather disappointingly on a car this capable, you'll have to pay extra for a space saver spare wheel. Still, there are a few other omissions. Even with entry-level trim, the seats are finished in a classy part leather. There's climate control and a heated windscreen, plus cruise control and 18-inch alloy wheels. Add to that an 8-inch colour infotainment touchscreen, via which you can Bluetooth link in your phone and access a 10-speaker DAB stereo system, and you have a strong contender. I like the little touches too, like the automatic air demister that senses a fogged up screen and clears it immediately. Of course, there's a lot more included further up the range. Above entry level trim, all variants include niceties like satellite navigation, auto headlights and wipers, front parking sensors, a powered tailgate and front fog lights. Here we've opted for plush HSE trim, which gives you Xenon headlights with LED driving lights, 19-inch alloy wheels, keyless entry, a reversing camera, an auto-dimming rear-view mirror, premium grained leather trim for the eight-way adjustable seats, 
a uh, huge panoramic glass sunroof that floods the cabin with light and an 11 speaker stereo setup including a subwoofer for really crisp bass response. If you're really into a yum music, you can even specify a thumping 17 speaker, 825 watt Meridian surround sound system with a state of the art amplifier. A setup that even at the end of your journey will keep you pinned to your driving seat to hear the final few beats of your favorite track. And of course, you can go much further still if funds permit. A quick scan of the options list will reveal things like configurable interior mood lighting, a head-up display, privacy glass, and a heated leather trimmed steering wheel. Opt for the parallel park assist system and maybe also the HD surround camera setup and tight spaces will be easy too. Clever extra cost features that might make day-to-day -day living just that little bit easier include headrest mounted iPad holders for rear seat passengers and a leather trimmed centre armrest cooler and warmer box, perfect for picnics. I'd also want the load spaced rails and the retention kit that together allow you to properly configure the luggage area. You may also want to personalise the look of your car with a contrasting roof colour in Santorini Black or Chorus Grey. Or perhaps add front and rear undershields, aluminium tread plates or stainless steel side tubes. Maybe even opt for bigger 20 inch alloy wheels. Some will also want to look at the black pack that adds this shade to the front grille, the door mirror caps, the front fender and the wheels. And there's some great infotainment technology on offer. Take the dual view touchscreen, as we would, a feature that allows driver and passenger to watch the same screen, but see completely different images. For example, the driver can be monitoring satellite navigation while the passenger enjoys a movie. It's all very clever, and it comes with the further option of a rear seat entertainment system, including a TV tuner and a pair of white fire digital headphones. Then there's the communication side of that same infotainment technology, which coordinates everything from satellite navigation to music streaming, internet radio and various location services. It's all primarily accessible through the optional Land Rover in Control apps setup. Developed with the experts at Bosch Softech, this works with both Apple and Android phones. You simply connect your handset into the car's USB port, then choose from a whole range of downloadable apps, including popular ones like Stitcher, Glimpse, Hotel Seeker, City Seeker, and Air Motion News. This function, in fact, is just one of a whole suite of Land Rover in control connected car technologies. Here I've got the in-control Wi-Fi system that enables you to create in your Discovery Sport a mobile 3G Wi-Fi hotspot, allowing up to eight electronic devices to be simultaneously connected. There's also the option of an in-control secure package that will track your Discovery Sport relentlessly should it be stolen, and an in-control remote feature via which you can monitor your fuel level and range remotely on your smartphone, get help in finding your car in a crowded car park, or even check if you've left the doors or the sunroof open. More significantly, In Control Remote will allow owners to summon help in the event of a breakdown or an accident. And the system will automatically send out an SOS message to the emergency services should you be incapacitated after a crash. Could be a lifesaver. On the subject of safety, well, Land Rover says it's gone the extra mile here. This, for example, is the first car in its segment to feature a pedestrian airbag, which deploys from the upper rear surface of the bonnet within 60 milliseconds, should you be unfortunate enough to ever hit someone. Injuries from such an accident will also be mitigated by a pedestrian-friendly design for the bonnet and for the bumper. Another first for the brand is an autonomous emergency braking system, which uses a digital stereo camera mounted next to the rearview mirror to detect objects that could pose a collision threat, delivering visual and audible warnings and automatically applying the brakes if a collision is imminent. 
Useful electronic safety options include automatic high beam assist, a setup that automatically dips your lights for you at night. Uh, then there's reverse traffic detection, a feature that warns you of approaching cars when you're reversing out of a parking space. You can also tick the box for a blind spot monitor that on the move stops you from dangerously pulling out to overtake in front of another car. Uh, a lane departure warning system uh, stops dozy drivers from veering out of their lanes on the highway. And there's a traffic sign recognition feature that pictures road signs as you drive and displays them on the dash. Other more expected features that justify this model's five-star Euro NCAP safety test showing include Isofix child seat fastenings, twin front, side and curtain airbags, plus knee bags for both driver and front passenger, as well as a whole range of electronic aids to ensure that an accident can be avoided in the first place. You'd expect such systems to help you with things like braking, traction and stability control. But there's also roll stability control and the peace of mind of realising that the roof will support more than 4.5 times the vehicle weight. Towers will be interested in the tow assist and tow hitch assist features that help you connect up with a trailer then stop it from swaying about on the move. Plus, automatic models also get hill start assist to stop you from drifting backwards on uphill junctions. Off-road, slippery slopes can more easily be dealt with thanks to gradient release control and hill descent control, while deep water is handled by a wade sensing feature. You might expect a Land Rover to cost a little more to run than a less capable rival, but the brand itself doesn't see things in that light. In fact, over the last few years, the Solihull Maker has devoted itself to an entire engine range redesign, culminating in the development of the British-built all-aluminium Ingenium TD4 diesel power plant lineup. There are two units on offer, both mated to permanent four-wheel drive. The E-Capability 150 PS version is inevitably the cleanest and most frugal, managing 129 grams per kilometre of CO2 and 57.7 miles per gallon on the combined cycle. Most buyers, though, will want the TD4 engine in Pokia 180 PS guise, where the CO2 figure is 139 grams per kilometre and the fuel return is 53.3 miles per gallon. Impressively, those figures apply to both manual and automatic variants. This means that the 65-litre fuel tank should give you a touring range of well over 700 miles. It certainly helps here that by making some bodywork components from aluminium, primarily the bonnet, the roof and the tailgate, Land Rover has made this car 24 kilograms lighter than its Freelander predecessor, despite its extra equipment. Standard is a stop-start system that cuts the engine when you don't need it, stuck in traffic or waiting at the lights, and on its own reduces CO2 emissions by up to 7%. Of course, the driver will need to play his or her part in pursuit of cleanliness and frugality, keeping an eye on the eco-data part of the infotainment screen, which gives you uh, a visual red, amber or green readout that allows you to monitor things like acceleration harshness, braking pressure and speed. There are also fuel stats that cover both your current journey and the averages achieved during the previous three. Plus, you can select an eco mode that optimizes the air conditioning and if you've the automatic version, optimizes the gear shift timings, all for maximum efficiency. What else? Residuals? These should be strong. If the Evoque is anything to go by, demand for this car will be extremely buoyant and depreciation correspondingly slight by class standards. Experts predict that after the usual three year ownership period, this car will still be worth between 52 and 55% of what you originally paid for it. Insurance groupings should see you rated somewhere between groups 28 and 31, which undercuts most rivals. As for the warranty, well, buyers get a three-year unlimited mileage package, but extensions are available. Plus, you can opt for a fixed price servicing plan that for a one-off payment of purchase covers you for five years or 50,000 miles.
Once more, Land Rover has looked at a market that many thought was packed to bursting point and spotted a significant gap, into which it's parked the Discovery Sport. What other car of this kind can seat seven, set off in the Serengeti and slot right in as easily in Sloan Square as it will in the tightest multi-storey car park space? No other premium compact SUV can do all this. Which is why this model is going to cause all kinds of headaches for similarly priced upmarket contenders of this kind sold by Audi, BMW, Volvo and Lexus. Discovery Sport buyers can get all the style and class of such cars with the additional versatility of seven seats, a feature that will also attract the attention of people who'd previously have had to settle for something Korean, like a Hyundai Santa Fe or a Kia Sorento. You get extra off-road prowess with a Discovery Sport too, though it's not quite a match for its German rivals if you want to throw your car around on tarmac. Fortunately, most SUV buyers don't, prioritising instead the kind of supple highway ride and fast, fluid responses this car is actually very good at delivering. It all means that for once, the advertising tagline for this model works for the product it's supposed to promote. Above and beyond was the objective in developing this car. In considering the end result, you'd have to say that mission's been accomplished.